Well, welcome to River Church. There are new things happening today. There are new things happening this week. Pastor uh, Billy is now here on staff, on site. He's been here this summer, uh, starting a couple of weeks ago, and so we're just tightening things up, rolling out, you know, the the the, the nursery in a in a new and improved fashion, tightening up what we do with our kids when we're talking about communion, how we how we take care of guests when they come through the door. So I hope you're noticing, and I hope that that that, that, that you're noticing that doesn't doesn't result in you thinking, hey, great, people are doing stuff around here. I hope what it results in is you having this sense of how might I be a part of this collective movement toward what's God going to do this year, this month, in the next 18 months? What's God going to do? So, so with that in mind, we're starting a new sermon series, and it is called The Summer of Love. And I was talking to Billy, and I was talking to Daniela, and I was talking about like tie-dyed clothes and, and the hippie generation, the summer of love. They had no clue what I was talking about. That's not totally true. But, but I realized that isn't really, it's not really a connection point. With old guys like, like some of us, summer of love reminds you of 1969, which happens to be the year that I was born. Uh, but nonetheless, nonetheless, we're calling this the summer of love. And the reason that we're doing that is because we're, we're looking at the epistle, 1 John, a really short book in your Bible. If you turn too many pages, if you turn three or four pages, you'll miss it totally. But we're looking at the, the book of 1 John, way late in the Bible, and this is what we're talking about. If you could put that next slide up, we're, we're talking about over the summer months, this theme, which is found all over the first epistle of John, and that is that the story of Jesus binds us together as friends. In 1987, I left Brownsville, a Homer Hanna High School graduate. That's what a public education can do for you, man. Uh, left in 1987 to, uh, to, to go off to college, and I experienced something in the next month or two that I had not experienced before. Um, I met a lot of people who were not like me, they were MKs, that's missionary kids, they were, they were PKs, that's preacher's kids, but they were also, they were farmers, and, and there were some, some, some soccer players, and, and there, were, there, were, there were dudes that were pledging fraternities, and ladies that were pledging sororities, and all these people that were not like me, but in a very short amount of time, we came together and became friends. And I say I hadn't experienced that before. Um, here's what I mean by that. In that context, in 1987, when I left and I went to a small, well, Abilene, Texas, to, to go to a small college there, uh, what, what I found for the first time ever was that I was in a group that was only, only brought together. The only thing that brought us together was the story of Jesus. Now, now, I grew up in church. I grew up in a good church, and we were, we were friends, and then there was the commonality of being Christ followers in that good church that I grew up in. But, but, but for the first time really ever, when I, when I reached Abilene, and most of you didn't have this experience when you went off to college, uh, but, but for me, for the first time ever, Kevin and Dwight and Todd and Michael and, and, and all that brought us together, my, my friends in that, that freshman year of college, all that brought us together was Jesus. All that brought us together was church. And, and really, it was not anything that I had ever experienced, at least to that level, before. I was used to friendships being, uh, that, that, were, that were cautiously made after everyone, you know how high school is, you know how middle school is, everyone sizes one another up. And you decide what group you fit into, and you, you you're looking for, 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 for maybe a friend who's like you, or 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 or, or somebody who who re, has reached the same status level that you have reached. You know, maybe you're in the artist group, or maybe you're in the nerd group, or maybe you're in the athletic group, or or you know the, the best group of all. You're, you're part of the cool kids. And honestly, that's, that, that 
even goes on, of course, within the church, right? But, but when I reached Abilene, it was just this weird environment, weird to me, where I, I wasn't being sized up. Now, the flip side of that is that I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to size other people up either, trying to put anybody else into a, into a category. It was a really good church that I got, that I got in, invested in, involved in, right, from the, right out of the gate when I, when I, when I reached college. And, and, and so some of us here today, the reason that you don't have as many friends as you would like to have, and, and maybe more specifically, the reason you don't have as many friends as you would like to have here at River Church, even though you've been here for a number of years, is because you're looking for friends who are just like you. Um, that fit into the same social status, and that's not, you've heard me say this before, that's not a church, that, that's a club. So there's a word that we find, there's a word that we find, if I can just geek out here for a minute, there's a word that we find in, uh, in 1 John and all over the Bible, but in 1 John, and it's going to come up time and time again, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Greek word, um, and you say it like this, koinonia. Koenonia. People put the, the emphasis on different syllables, but that's actually the appropriate way to say it. Koenonia. Now, can you say that with me? And then I'm going to tell you what it means. Koenonia. Koenonia. But loud. Come on, one more time. Koenonia. Okay. Now, that is, that is the Greek word for, for fellowship. For, for, for coming together, this, finding some commonality, becoming friends, um, it is fellowship. Now, interestingly, the, this isn't exactly the right way of saying it, but I'm going to say it this way because this is how we talk in English. The, the root word, uh, koine, um, is a word that you that you wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't use, but I'm going to tell you what it means. Just say that with me. Koine. Koine. So we have koine and we have koinonia. Okay, so koine actually means common. So, so the, the, the Bible, the New Testament, not the Old Testament, but the New Testament was written in what they call koine Greek. All that really means is common Greek. But there's this, there's this nuance to the word where it actually can mean crude, common, or crude. And if there's going to be koinonia in the church, fellowship in the church, there's going to be a commonality. Even, hear me out now, even a bit of crudeness. In other words, there's nothing really special about us. Maybe we don't dress too well. Maybe we don't know which, which fork to eat, we eat our meat with and which fork to eat our dessert with. We don't come together because we're all that. We don't come together and figure out if I level up, maybe I can be a part of your group. There's a, a commonality in which we, even, we even, even receive and embrace a bit of crudeness because there's nothing real sophisticated about this sort of fellowship. It's interesting. I said that the, 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 the New Testament was all written in Koine Greek. Get this. Jesus, when he would have been in his home, he wouldn't have spoken Koine Greek. Now, he would have gone to the temple or the tabernacle, and, he, and Jesus knew plenty of, of Hebrew. That's one language. Uh, Jesus, would, in his home with his mom and dad, we don't know for sure, but probably would have spoken Aramaic. So why was the Bible, the New Testament, written in Koine Greek? Well, th this Greek, it was like a trade language. It was like a language, not like, it was a language that crossed borders and, and brought people together. It was, it was somewhat of a crude, common 
language, Koine Greek, but it was meant to bring people together that might not otherwise relate and be friends. A commonality, an accepted crudeness, but we're going to use this language, Koine Greek, because it will bring more people together. So Jesus knew enough Koine Greek to be able to go out and relate in that common sort of way, although when he went to the tabernacle, he would have spoken Hebrew. When he got, went home, he would have spoken Aramaic. Now, if, 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 if that wasn't the preferred language, Koine Greek, why did all of the New Testament writers write in Koine Greek? Again, it was so that we might be brought together. There might be a commonality, even a crude sort of coming together. And if we're going to be a church, it's going to be based on that kind of friendship. You're going to be friends with, you're going to fellowship with people who aren't like you. Who in your old, broke-down self, you might have said, they're beneath me. Or they're way above me. The only common thing that has brought us together is the story of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you a little bit about, about the author of, of this epistle, uh, John. John the Apostle. He didn't just write 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the three epistles toward the end of your, of your Bible. He also wrote the very last book in, in, our, in, our, in today's Bible. It's the, the, the last book, the book of Revelation. He also, if you move way early into the New Testament, he wrote the fourth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So he wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote the three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then he wrote the last book in the Bible, Revelation. Who is this John? Years ago, I preached for like two years, I preached through the Gospel of John. And so years ago, I told you about, about John the disciple of Jesus, the, the friend of Jesus. But it's been a while, so I want to tell you about it again. He had a relationship, a privileged relationship with his slightly older mentor, teacher, rabbi, Jesus. In that day, the, the student-teacher relationship was very different than it is now. Like, your teacher, you're not going to see him for three months, right? They're, they're locked up in the school cabinet, and, and when you go back to school, they'll let them out, and they'll teach you again starting in September. But, but teaching, I'm not, I'm kidding there, but teaching back then, teaching back then was, was, was different. Uh, there was, you didn't go off to the university. What you would do is you would find a rabbi. You would find a teacher, and then you would attach yourself to that person, You'd live with that person. You would follow that person around. It was, it was, it was very honoring if that, if that rabbi would accept you into his school. And then you would, you would live with them and follow them around for several years. In Jesus' case, for three years. And that's the kind of relationship that John had with Jesus. John is associated with his brother. Do you remember his brother's name? It was James. James and John, the two brothers. James is probably the older brother. And they were known as the sons of Zebedee. And they had, a, they had their own business. They had their father's business, which was being passed down to them. They were fishermen. John was probably in his late 20s when he first saw Jesus. Jesus is around 30 at this point, so they're young guys. As I said, John's a fisherman. You know, at least seven of the 12, at least seven of the 12 apostles that followed Jesus for those three years were fishermen by trade. I love that. Early risers, strong backs. It's no accident. Those are the men that Jesus chose as his disciples. So they had several boats, the Zebedee brothers. Uh, they, they were probably 
partners with Peter's family, and they probably all work together in this multi-family business. We have the story of, of, of they, they, they're fishing on the Sea of Galilee, and in that day, in that, er, in that era and in that territory, the fishing was commonly done at night. I'm not really sure why that is, but it was commonly done at night. And so they fish, and they fish, and they catch too much, too, too many fish. In fact, um, I'll just read this to you briefly. In Luke chapter 5, they catch so many fish that it's filling both boats. The boats are going to sink. And Jesus calls John to be his follower. It says, they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. And then Jesus says, John, you and your brother come be my disciples. And then later on in chapter 5 of Luke, it says, when they had brought their boats to land, it says this, they left everything and followed Jesus. And when we read that John left everything, it's easy to think that he left all of his monetary possessions. And certainly that is true. But think on the fact that he left a lot more than just wealth that day when he left everything, as Luke says, and followed Jesus. It was a really common day. They'd fished all night. They are probably going to sleep the morning away. And yet it was a really very unique opportunity. So he leaves the nets and the boats in his dad's employees' hands, he and James both, and they follow. I think we have Mark chapter 1. It says this. It says, immediately he called James and John, Jesus, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they followed Jesus. And for the next three years, Jesus seems to take on John as his special little project, as his student, the one that he loved, perhaps like a, a brother, perhaps like a, a kid brother. What's one of the signs of, of someone seeing you like a kid brother or seeing you as a kid sister? And it would be that they give you a nickname, right? Some of the nicknames that I'm familiar with, some of these come from our, our family and some of them don't, but like Boo or Bubba or Tiny Dancer or uh, Emma Babema or Lydia Lulu or Red, or Noli, or, or whatever. Like, these names that the older siblings give to the younger siblings. And, and I see that as being sort of the relationship that Jesus had, especially with this, perhaps his youngest apostle, uh, John. Because Jesus gave John and his brother James, he gave them nicknames too. He called them the sons of thunder, the sons of thunder. I've said this before, but it sounds very NASCAR to me or very WWE. Is that the right acronym for wrestling? I don't watch professional wrestling, but it sounds very NASCAR, very WWE, the sons of thunder. But it was an appropriate, it was an appropriate nickname because John, if you read the Gospels, what you realize is that John was rough. He was somewhat crude. He was impetuous. And over the course of the three years of Jesus' ministry, we have several accounts in which Jesus rebukes and corrects young John. But ultimately, ultimately, John receives a new nickname. He goes from being known as the son of thunder, to ultimately being called simply the one whom Jesus loved. The one whom Jesus loved. It's one of the most endearing nicknames in all of the Bible. And then if I can finish this little summary of who John was, 
Let, rem let me remind you of two or three final pictures that we have of John. One would be at the Last Supper, Jesus in the upper room with his 12 disciples, and he institutes, the, he says, from now on you do this, do this in remembrance of me, the Last Supper. And the other, the other picture that, that, that I want to conjure up for us is at the crucifixion where Jesus is actually on the cross. So first of all, first of all, the Last Supper. You've probably seen one of the, one of the famous paintings, uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting of the Last Supper, and you recall that there's one disciple who seems to be leaning on, have, have his head, has his head on, on the shoulder of, of Jesus, and, and uh, we believe that was most likely John, the one whom Jesus loved, this young, impetuous disciple that, 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 that Jesus had determined to, to, to love and to, to mold and to shape. What you may not know, um, unless you're a really good student of the Bible, you may not know this, but, but John was actually uh, responsible for setting up that Lord's Supper. Jesus sends him along with Peter, the rock. He sends Peter and John on ahead to prep for, for, the, for the Last Supper. He tells them, run ahead and prepare and, and set the table. And, and, and why is that? Why did he give that responsibility to John and to Peter? Well, because, because John is faithful. John is loyal. You can, you can count on John. I, I really believe that some of the apostles that Jesus had follow him, he wasn't sure he could count on. But he knew he could count on John. You'll see that in the next story that I tell you. John was one of those, I'll drive out and find you when you get lost kind of guys. He was faithful. He, he was, he was, this is the kind of guy that you want on your side. So when Jesus needed important things uh, done, he would call on John. Interestingly, at the Last Supper, we learned that when people wanted, when the other apostles wanted to ask Jesus a question, they would go to John and say, John, Go ask Jesus and then whatever they wanted to know. We know that from the story of the Last Supper. He had that sort of unique, special relationship. He was the one whom Jesus loved. The other picture that I give you is we just, get, just, just give a, a brief summary of, of who John was. It's the story of the crucifixion. At the crucifixion, um, specifically John chapter 19, it says, when Jesus saw his mother, he's on the cross. When Jesus saw his mother, of course he's looking down because he's on the cross, saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, who is that? That's John. When he saw his mother and he saw his disciple, the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, the one whom he loved, John, he said, he said, behold your mother. And the text goes on and says, and from that hour the disciple took uh, her to his home. And for the, rest of his for the rest of her life, John, this, this young, impetuous disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, the one, the one whom Jesus could count on, the faithful one, for the rest of her life, John, took Jesus' mother into his home and cared for her as she was, as though she were his mother. You know, there's no evidence that the foot of the cross, there's no evidence from the Bible that, that, there, was, that there were any other disciples there. We know that Peter had denied Jesus and had, had run away. We know that Judas had gone and hanged himself. There is no evidence that any other apostle of any of the other 12 were at the foot of the cross at that moment. The Bible is silent. Perhaps everyone else at that moment had abandoned Jesus except John. See, now John has grown up, and, and he has a, a pastor's heart. 
And that's why he had the privilege of writing five books in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, the three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. Whatever happened to, 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 to John? Where did he ultimately, how did it turn out for John? Well, according to written history, written church history from the second century A.D., according to written history from that era, John lived um, well beyond Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Uh, we, we know from the book of Revelation that he went to this I island called Patmos for a while, and Jesus visited him supernaturally, and he wrote the book, the book of Revelation. But ultimately, what we know from written history is that John lived to an extremely old age in Ephesus, most likely. Um, and he was so old that he had to be carried around from church meeting to church meeting. And they honored him as a church father. So they, would, they didn't forget about him. They would, they would carry him. And, and, and because of his age, he was unable to really talk for the most, for the most part. He, again, he lived to a really extremely old age. Except that as they would carry him from one meeting to the next meeting, he would simply repeat over and over again, Little children, love one another. And then he would say it again. Little children, love one another. Little children, love one another. And he died with a, with a pastor's heart, a, a love for the church, with a sincere concern that the church love one another. So John has written this letter. We're about to read it now. That's all intro. Uh, he, the, the, the first epistle of John. The last thing you need to know is that he wrote this letter to, to refute a message being taught by, those, by, by, by a group of people who had recently left the church. So he writes this letter specifically to refute their false teaching, what we would call false doctrine. You see, in leaving the church, this group, some believe it was a precursor to a, a, a false theology known as Gnosticism, but the, the, this group, they, they, in leaving the church, um, they had left, they'd left their faith. They, they no longer believed in the deity of, of Jesus Christ. They no longer believed in the humanity of Jesus Christ, that he was fully God, that he was fully man. And what's interesting to note, and we're going to talk about this more over the next six weeks, what's interesting to note is that the result of their leaving the faith and, and no longer believing in Jesus, the, 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 the end result was a disregard for one another, a lack of of koinonia, fellowship. That was the result of them becoming apostate, determining they didn't believe in Jesus anymore, was that they no longer cared in a common and even crude fashion for one another. They just broke up into their little, their little clubs. With that, let's read 1 John 1. It goes like this. This is very poetic, so I want you to understand it, and it's laid out in that way. Actually, it's not, but in, the, in, the, in, in your Bible, it actually is laid out in a way, in a, in a verse by verse, um, very symmetrical way, um, and, it's, it, and so it reads like that. It's poetic, it's symmetrical, it's, it's um, very identical or similar phrase after phrase, what was, what we, what we... And then later on, we're going to get more what was, what we, what we. But it's all a statement, first of all, of what John believed with all of his heart. It goes like this. 
what was from the beginning. I'll just, I'll just let you know. He's talking about Jesus. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That life was revealed, and we have seen it, and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you. Okay, all of that was pretty much a statement of faith, and I'll unpack that here in a minute. This is what we've seen, this is what we've heard, this is what we believe, this is what we've touched, this is what we've felt. And all that we declare to you so that, so that, why do we do all that? Why have we declared all that? So that you may have koinonia, so that you may have fellowship along with us, and indeed our koinonia, our fellowship, is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. That's kind of the capstone. He says, have we written these things so that we might have fellowship with one another? And we're writing these things so that we might have fellowship with our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And then the capstone is so that our joy tank might be filled to overflowing. Did you know that you have a joy tank? I think you know that. You may not call it that, but it may be running on empty right now, or it may be half full. And John says, here's the ticket to you having a joy tank that is overflowing. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. We'll come back to it here in just a minute. The major heresy of this fragment group that had left the church in John's day that so broke his heart. The major heresy of several heres- heretical beliefs that they, that they uh, attested to, the major heresy was their denial of Jesus as a human being. What do we believe in the church? What does the Bible tell us? That, that Jesus was completely God, fully God, and he was completely man, fully man. And all of the things that he accomplished for us on the cross could not have been accomplished except that he was fully God and he was fully man. If he would have just been man, well, then his death wouldn't have meant that much because it'd be just like me dying or or, or you dying, but he was the God-man. And so, therefore, it was the appropriate sacrifice. But also, if he wouldn't have been fully man, it wouldn't have been a real death. It wouldn't have been a real blood sacrifice, and so it wouldn't have meant what it meant and what it means. And so he's the God-man. The major heresy of the fragment group that that had left the church was the the denial of the humanity of Jesus. And so so John writes this letter to fight truth, uh, to fight for truth, uh, to fight against heresy, and to convey this. It's like he's saying to them and like he's saying to us, hey, guys, hey, friends, hey, ladies. If Jesus is the God-man, both God and human, then this truth is a really great source to our joy tank being filled up. How is that going to happen? Fellowship with God one another. That's the end game. That's the result. That's where he's going in this first little paragraph, the beginning of this apostle. Okay, let's take a look at that. Let's reread this passage. If you can just go one cell earlier, one slide earlier. Okay, so he makes the state. He makes several statements. The first statement he makes is, um, and by the way, these are all doctrinal statements, and if you would say, hey, you know what? I don't, I don't attest to all those. That's okay, but I would encourage you, I would invite you to become a believer to become a Christ follower. Here are the central tenets of our faith. Here's what a Christ follower believes. If if you say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christ follower, then this is 
uh, according to the Bible, what you believe. The, the belief isn't the end result. The benefits are the end result. The belief is, is the catalyst. This is what a Christ follower believes. Number one, he says that Jesus was from the beginning. He says it in a poetic, kind of beautiful way. Well, what was from the beginning? He's saying, he's saying well, the answer is Jesus is from the beginning. What does that sound like to you if you, rem if you remember how the Gospel of John begins? The Gospel of John begins with, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word is referencing Jesus. You can see the similarity in how John writes this epistle and how he wrote the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He wrote that book. He also wrote this book, which starts with, what was from the beginning? He's saying, number one, Jesus has always been. He's eternal. He's speaking of the deity of Jesus. The second thing he says is, he, John is saying, I, I and the other, the other apostles, um, we heard him. He says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard. Number two, he's saying, we heard him. You can't tell me I didn't hear Jesus. I, I heard his voice. You might say, you know, he, 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 he had like this, uh, this baritone, baritone tenor about his voice. He might say, and this would be accurate, he might say, he spoke like a Galilean. He had a Galilean dialect, just like me, John would say, just like all of us fishermen from Galilee. We kind of had this hick talk, and then Jesus was a Galilean, so he had that Galilean dialect. And, and, and so, 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 so John is saying, number one, he is from the, he, Jesus was from the beginning. Number two, he says, we, we heard the voice of Jesus. He, he talked to us. And then and the third thing he says is, we have seen him with our eyes. They're saying, ah, you can't tell me I didn't see Jesus. You can't tell me that Jesus wasn't a human being, that, that he was some uh, figment of my I saw him in my own eyes. I looked him in the eyes. And then he goes on and he says, he says, what we have observed. So he's going beyond just we saw him with our eyes. They're saying, we observed him. For three years, we, we looked upon him. We watched his coming and his going. I can tell you some stories that aren't even in, in, in my books, John says, like of, of how Jesus rolled, of, of what he was like. He says, J Jesus was from the beginning, and, 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 and I saw him along with the other apostles, and, and, and we heard his voice. And, and it not, not only did we see him, but, but we, we looked deeply, intently into his ways. And then he goes on and he says, um, and we touched him with our hands. I don't know, he could be talking about, remember the story of, of Doubting Thomas, where Doubting, Doubting Thomas is away and he comes back and he's like, yeah, I've heard Jesus walked out of the tomb, but I won't believe it until I put my, my fingers in, his, in, in the, the holes in his, in his hands where he's crucified until I touch the the scar on his side, and then Jesus shows up, and, and Thomas immediately says, you know, my, my Lord and my God, and we don't know if he actually ever really did, like, test it out. Uh, I think maybe not, but, but, but who knows? Maybe, maybe that's what he's saying. We touch with our own hands. Maybe John is referencing the fact that, that when he was tired, perhaps he would, he would put his head on the shoulders of Jesus as they would pray, as they would observe the Last Supper, according to da Vinci's rendering. It says, it says, he was a man. He was a real human being. I touched him. I know. I shook his hand. So he says, Jesus was from the beginning. He was the God man. And Jesus had a real voice because I heard it. He had this baritone Galilean dialect. He, he had a real voice. He was a real man. He was the God man. We, we saw him with our own eyes. We, we, we gazed upon him. We looked upon him. We, we, we observed his ways. We, 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 we touched him with our own hands. And then he says, and he says, the result, 
the result of this, speaking of concerning the word of life, he, he gives all these other ways of describing who Jesus is. He's, he's the God-man. And then in verse 4, go to the next slide, he says the result is, the result is we have fellowship one another, with one another. We, we resonate with one another because of who Jesus was and is and always will be. We have this commonality about us, fellowship with one another, and then he says, and then we have fellowship with God as a result of that. And in the capstone, in result, our joy tanks are filled up. And John, John begins this book refuting this false doctrine by saying, this is the message of the church. That Jesus was the God-man, he was crucified, he was buried, he was resurrected, he ascended into heaven. What we have seen, what we have heard, we are telling you so that you can rally around the truth, not for the sake of the truth, but so that we can rally around the truth that we might fellowship together, that we might fellowship with the Lord and that our joy might be complete. So what, how I want to wrap this up today is this. I want to say, what's with this joy uh, tank filling sort of idea? So that your joy might be complete. In, in Greek, it literally says, so that we may rejoice in fullness, not in part, but in fullness, not, not just a haphazard sort of rejoicing, an afterthought sort of rejoicing, but, but a, a full-on, full-throttle rejoicing. That is what the Christian life is meant to be. And if you're not experiencing that, then you are not fully experiencing what the Lord has for you. All right, so we all have a tank. It's all wanting for more joy. Every one of us in here, our joy tank probably is not filled 100%. It probably isn't overflowing, but that is what is being offered to us here. And so I want to end right now, the, the rest of our time together. What is, what is it about Jesus that fills my joy tank? Number one, in Jesus... In Jesus, there is friendship with God. There's friendship with God. And what I know, what I know, dear friends, is that many of you here in this room, you do not think of God in that way. You don't think of him as a friend. Maybe, maybe you, you feel like that would be irreverent. Uh, maybe you've never had a good friend. And so you don't want to think of God that way, but well, I'll show you a couple of passages. John chapter 15, Jesus says this, no longer, this is the words of Jesus, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. This is the Lord Jesus speaking to his followers, but, but also speaking to us. I, I call you friends for all that I... I've heard from my Father I have made known to you this, this concept that, 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 that the God in heaven who is tra transcendent beyond our ability to comprehend is also imminent in that, he, in that He came down to earth to relate to us, yes, more importantly to, to pay the penalty for our sin so that he might say, you were once strangers, you were once enemies, you were once, once outcasts, but now I have made you friends. The, the late, dear uh, evangelist Billy Graham used to tell, tell this, uh, give this analogy or this metaphor. And as a little kid, I used to love it. I think it holds water theologically, but it's just a great metaphor, a great little analogy, rather. And it was that that it would be like if you, and like any metaphor, it breaks down if you squeeze it too hard, but uh, it, it's like if, if you saw an ant, and you're like, man, I wonder, 
I wonder what they're thinking. I wonder what they're feeling. I wonder what they're... And so you decided, I'm going to do it. I'm going to become an ant. You went down and you, you related to them as ants. Now, I do not mean to imply that God has to wonder what we're thinking, that he doesn't, that he's never known. He's always, he's always known. He's your creator God. He's your heavenly father. But, but in that same sort of sense as Billy Graham would speak of, our heavenly father, the deity, determined Jesus Christ would come and he would relate to us and he would, he would, he would become one of us without giving up any of his godness and in so doing, he invites us to be his friend. There's another passage I want you to see, James chapter 2. It says this, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as a righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. What I want you to understand is that in Jesus, you now have access to this same friendship. In fact, if I'm appropriately interpreting the epistle, this first, this first chapter of 1 John, if I'm appropriately interpreting this, and I believe I am, then, then he is saying this is one of the high callings, one of the, one of the high results, one of, one, of, one of the great effects of all the theology that we believe in, of all the things, of all the orthodox teachings that we embrace, and we do, but of all those, we don't embrace them just to embrace them. We don't embrace them so that we might be, you know, standard bearers of the truth. We embrace them because ultimately what it means is we, we, we have access to the Lord. We are friends of the Lord. John left a lot to follow Jesus. He left the boats and he, he left his family and he left the business. and He never went back to it uh, because... You know, Peter went back to it briefly, but, but John, he became one of the stalwart church fathers, and he was an evangelist, and he was a, he was a, he was a church builder and a church planting till, planter and a writer till the day he died. And, and so he left a lot. And what John wants you to know is that it was worth it all. What John, if he were here, if the Apostle John were here today, he, he would tell you, if you were considering some big change in order to follow Jesus... And, and, and I don't know. The Lord may not be calling you to make some great change to follow him. He may be telling you just as steady as she goes. But what John wants you to know, if you are considering some great big change to follow Jesus, he would want you to know it's worth it. He would tell you, you do it. It's worth it. I walked away from my nets. It was worth it. <clears throat> you do it. He would say words like redemption and like the gospel and like there's no more guilt, there's no more, more, more shame, there's no more enmity between you and the Lord. You become a friend of the Lord. He would tell you, <clears throat> he would say to you, believe me, it's worth it. There's a second. There's a second way in which Jesus fills my joy tank, and that is number two in Jesus. In Jesus, <clears throat> there is friendship with others. And we've really kind of talked about that for the last 40 minutes, haven't we? In Jesus, there's friendship with believers. This, this shared community, this shared commonality, this crude sort of friendship. Like maybe you don't do things the way I do. Maybe you don't socioeconomically, politically, culturally, um, see things the way that I do, but the Lord has brought us together. There's kononia. There's fellowship to be had. In Jesus, there's friendship. This has always been the design of the church. The book of Philippians, look what the, what the author says. It says, I thank my God in all remembrance of you. It would be like if I left and then I wrote you a letter and I said this. This is what's going on. To, to the church in Philippi, I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, 
all, uh, for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel and from the first day until now. It's such a church planner who loves his people. That is a church marked by fellowship. In addition to Jesus, in addition to being a savior, in addition to being a healer, in addition to being a teacher, Jesus was a good friend. In John 29, here's the story. Jesus had been crucified. Uh, all, of the, all, of the, all of the apostles had scattered. Peter, especially Peter uh, the rock uh, on whom Jesus would build his church, uh, he decided, like, I'm damaged goods. I better go back to fishing. They'd all scattered. They were all back in their hometown. Um, I, I guess the Sea of Galilee kind of had that effect like Brownsville does, kind of just sucks you right back, right? So, uh, so the Sea of Galilee, they all went back. They're, well, not about all of them, but some of them went back. They're fishing this morning. And then what happens is after fishing all night, they look, and, and there's Jesus. There's Jesus at, um, on, on the bank. This is, this is post-death, burial, resurrection Jesus. And it says, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in the place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were too many to count, the net was not torn. And then Jesus said to them, come, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus was, was revealed to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. The point is that Jesus was a good friend. Like, he's the standard bearer, right? We're, like, we're supposed to be like Jesus, right? Well, Jesus was a good friend. So quite simply, if you're not a good friend, then you're not like Jesus. Because Jesus was a good friend. And he has called us to be good friends in the church. So, got a little longer than I wanted to do today, but that is where we're headed over the next six weeks. That is the drum in which I will be beating each week over the next six weeks. And the conclusion, the main point today is that in Jesus, there is, there is deep, dear friendship to be had. I invite you to the summer of love. I invite you to find friendships here at River Church. I invite you to uh, come to our prayer gathering on Tuesday night. That is a great opportunity to make some new friends, to meet some new people. I invite you to go online and send us an email as a quick, easy intuitive sort of button to press, and we, we will get you connected to a gospel community. I invite you to go back to the gospel community that you used to be in. I invite you to ramp up your gospel community again. If it's been floundering, I invite you to find deep friendship here at River Church. Would you bow with me?